Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us? As you stand, since it looks like we're running out of room, uh, we would really appreciate if you could move towards the center of the aisle to let people that are coming in uh, get towards the end. That would be great. Thank you all. Stand and sing with us because we're going to sing the song, This is Amazing Grace, what we're celebrating here today. Let's sing. Just so we can let you know a little bit more about who we are and just send you a little gift. 
Uh, we're not going to put you on an email list or anything like that. We just want to say thank you for stopping by. Thank you for visiting us, and we'd love to have you join us for more. Uh, right now, we're going to have a time of greeting, so if you would stand and meet so many people around you and say hello to your neighbor. Please stand and sing some more songs with us. We're going to sing the song, Because He Lives. And it is because He lives that we are here today celebrating. And after we sing that, we're going to sing about crowning Him with many crowns. Our King has risen from the dead and is now seated in heaven. So we will celebrate that together.
Is anyone home? Is anyone here?
Is there anywhere else you'd rather be on a Sunday morning than right here today? I would not want to be anywhere else. Amen. Thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Is he worthy? He is. In 1958, Lloyd's Bank surveyed the fate of 100,000 paperclips. Paperclips. 25,000 fell to the floor and were swept away. 19,413 were used as chips in card games. 14,163 were twisted or broken during phone conversations. 7,200 temporarily uh, replaced broken buttons, snaps, or zippers. 5,434 were used as toothpicks or ear cleaners. Five, I'll let you figure out. 5,308 were used to clean fingernails. 3,916 were used as pipe cleaners. Remember, this is 1958. Leaving only 20,000 paper clips which actually serve their proper function. What do we do from this? It stinks to be a paper clip. <laughs> it's unbelievable that 80%, one out of every five paper clip, was not used for its intended purpose. Now, I like to think of myself as a professional reminder. I don't know if you guys know this or not, know this or not, but you were created with purpose. You were created to, to know God. And here's the deal. This morning, we're just, I'm just going to remind you of some things that you probably already know. You should know. And in reality, the story of Jesus and his resurrection hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Now, some people have tried to change it, right? Uh, some people have said, well, they just stole his body, they snuck it away. And so now we just celebrate the spirit of the risen Christ. Some people actually said that Jesus just kind of slipped into a coma. He went into the tomb. People took and took his body away. And he died of natural causes later on in life. But we have faith. We have faith. We know that that is impossible. That Jesus was real. That he lived. That he died. And that he rose again. And if you go to where he supposedly is buried, you won't find him there. We serve and we worship a resurrected Savior. So again, my goal today is just twofold. It's to reveal and to remind. That's it. For some of you, this might be the first time that you hear that God loves you. And that He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And He wants to know you. For the others of you, maybe you've been blinded. Maybe you need to be reminded of this hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And this is this weekend we remember and we celebrate, all because of the great love that Jesus has for us. For us. But it's more intimate than that. It's more intimate than the love that he has for the world. Yes, he loves the world, but here's the deal. He loves you. He loves you. So you can write this down if you want to take notes. You were created to be loved by God and know him personally. You were created to be known by God and to love him and to know him personally. As a matter of fact, some of the prophets wrote in Jeremiah. Jeremiah said this. He says that you are loved with an everlasting love. That God knew you and he created you and he loved you before time began. Later on, Paul reminds us of this. And he says, in love you were chosen and predestined for adoption. For his good pleasure. It was for God's pleasure that he created you individually. You can put your name right there. God loved me. He created me so that he had a relationship with me. It was for his good pleasure. And not only that, but you have the fingerprint of God on your life. You can go all the way back to the beginning. We know in Genesis, Moses wrote, in the image of God, he created you. You were created in the image of God. Again, these are all incredibly great truths. But sometimes we're blinded. Sometimes we forget these truths that God has for our lives. So today, I would pray that your eyes might be open, that your spirit might be receptive to what God has to speak to you today. 
And I would ask for you to pray for one another. Pray where you're sitting. Pray for the person sitting next to you, behind you. That they might be open to what God has to say to them today. Because the battle is real. Now, you all know that I come from California, and I've kind of been in different church models over the past 25 years. So this is a little bit different, right? And so there's some things that I just have not done, and I'm not really comfortable with doing, but what I felt like was laid upon my heart this week, at the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. So when the message is over with, I would pray and I would ask that you would just be sensitive to believing the Holy Spirit. And if you feel like God is speaking to you and you want to give your life to Him, I'm going to tell you right up front. Here's the pitch. I'm not a salesman. I would be a horrible used car salesman. I own one suit. It's for marrying and for burying. That's it. But if you feel like God is speaking in your spirit today, I would invite you to come forward. I'm just going to be standing over here on the side. You can come and pray around the altar. You can go around to the back. We have some deacons back there. You can go to the side. Wherever you want to just spend a little time with God and pray, I'm going to offer that to you right now, right up front. I'm going to ask you to prepare your heart for what God has to tell you today. We you allow Him to reveal truth to you this morning? Do you allow Him to remind you of why you were created? So that you could know Him, that you can love Him. Will you do that today? Now you see, here's the problem. We have an enemy that tries to keep us from knowing and understanding that reality of a relationship with God. We often are blinded to the truth. We're blinded to it. And He's present even here today. You may not think it, but He is. He causes distraction. He tries everything He can to keep us from understanding God's love for us. And we've been caught up in the fray, and it's begun from the very beginning. You see, you can write this down. You see, we chose, we chose to exchange the truth for a lie. We chose to exchange the truth for a lie. Now, you might be sitting there. I don't know your church background, how, how long you've been in church. Maybe this is your first Sunday. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this. And you're probably sitting there. You might be thinking to yourself, how in the world did I choose to exchange the truth for a lie? How many of you guys have ever heard anything come from the back seat of your car that sounded something like this? Tell him to stop. Tell him to stop. He's touching me. He's touching me. Anybody? I'm not bothering nobody. He's looking at me. You ever hear that one? He's telling him to stop looking at me. Right? See, the reality is, too, that our actions have consequences, consequences and they affect other people. So the sin of Adam and Eve in the very beginning affects us here today. And so we choose, we chose to exchange the truth for a lie. All the way back in the beginning, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we read this, it says that they saw that the fruit was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining knowledge, right? They were tempted right from the beginning, and they made that choice. They thought that they could be like God, and they could be above God. And they, they bought the lie. And then later on in Romans, Paul writes, he says, they exchanged the truth for a lie and worshiped the created, not the creator. And I believe we see this now more than ever. How many of you guys have one of these right here? Come on. Come on. <laughs> this little device right here causes more distractions than anything else in the world right now, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Have you ever been around a teenager or a child? That's unfair. Anyone <laughs> who has lost access to one of these right here and they've just absolutely thrown a fit? You know what I'm talking about it. I mean, even yesterday, I was literally writing this message. I'm getting ready. I'm, I'm working all my stuff out. And, and I get so distracted. The little light comes on, you know, and it kind of flashes. You're like, who is that? What is that? And then, you know, you pick it up, and then it turns into everything else, right? Then it's Twitter, and Instagram, and Snapchat, and Facebook, and everything, right? And, and it's good for some things. I mean, did you know that Moscow has an incredible choir? That Moscow has this special choir. I didn't know about the special choir that Russia has that was formed out of Moscow, but but I found it yesterday. <laughs> and it is so special that I want to share it with you this morning. Just to prove a point. <laughs> How far down a rabbit hole can we go? <laughs> so are you ready? I want to introduce you to the Mas Moscow singing tongue choir. Are you ready for this? Watch this. <laughs>
bit. I'm telling you. Right? We get so distracted. We get blinded to the truth. Do you think it's by accident that if you look on the back of this phone right here, the logo that is used, does anyone know what the logo is? It's an apple. Right? And there's a bite taken out of it. Now, I know the bites are bits and bites and all that kind of stuff in the computers. But if you were to go back and you were really to see the, the origin of that, why is it an apple? Now, an apple represents the fruit of the tree. Now, we know, we know, we don't know if it was an apple. Okay, I understand, right? <laughs> but now we've just kind of moved that into that position. It may have been an apple, it may have been something else. You know what it is. But it's not by accident, it's not by coincidence that on the back of this phone is an apple. Because the apple represents knowledge. And if you have this, you have access to knowledge. We exchange the truth for a lot. We want to be like God. We want to be better than God. We don't need God. We can all figure it out just with one of these devices right here. And it distracts us. It distracts us from the truth that God wants us to have in his relationship with Jesus. So... Now, the passage scripts are really this morning, you've probably not heard associated with Easter, but I think that there's probably nobody better to, to tell us and to remind us who we are when we have a relationship with God through Jesus than Peter. So if you have your Bibles, and if you want to turn there, we'll be in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, looking at just verses 9 and 10. And we're going to be in some other verses too, but that's going to be our primary passage this morning. And I want to give you a little bit of context for this passage. You have to understand, again, this is Peter. And we know Peter, he was one of Jesus' closest friends. But I also think he's most like us. If you read about him, you'll find out that he was brash, he was questioning, he oftentimes spoke too soon, he was impatient, he was inconsistent, but he was also very practical. At one point he declared Jesus as Lord and Messiah, then he denied him three times. Three times. He said that he would die with Jesus, but then when the pressure got too great, what did he do? He fled. He took off. He was a fisherman who ultimately became the leader of the church. And so he's writing a letter to the scattered church, people who are under persecution. And this is a letter of encouragement, and it's also a letter of how these people can live out their faith. So in verse 9, chapter 2, this is what we read. But you are. Pause. But you are. So we have to go back a little bit to understand this because he's continuing a thought. So you have to know the thought before this before we can actually continue on through this. So he goes back. I want you to look back to verse 7. And so this is what he says. This is right before this. This is, this is he's reminding them of who they are. He says this. Now, to you who believe. This is who his audience is. To you who believe. To you who receive Jesus Christ into your life. This stone is precious. He's talking about Jesus. But then he says this. But to those who do not believe. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. He said, you're not like them. You were the ones that, that rejected Jesus. Your identity is in Christ. You are a, a new person. You did reject the chief cornerstone. You're not the one who disobeyed the gospel. You received that. So I have to ask you this morning, which category do you fall in? Have you accepted Jesus Christ into your life? Is he your chief cornerstone? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Or have you rejected him? Either yes or no. Have you found your identity in Jesus Christ? Do you know his love? Do you have a relationship with him? If you have, then we can move on. So if you are, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not his people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Today, we celebrate the greatest day in history. Jesus rose from the grave so that you could be what Peter describes. And these words, they're significant. They're incredibly important. They're specifically chosen. Peter condensed the entire Old Testament into these four 
ideas to remind us and to remind his audience of who they are, who you are, when you give your life to Christ. So four things, very quickly. One, he is risen so that you can know grace. He is risen so you can know grace. So back in the verse, we begin. He says that you are a chosen people. When you receive Jesus Christ into your life, you are adopted into his family. And that is the ultimate expression of grace. God provided you a free gift. He said, I'm going to allow my son to come and to die on the cross for your sins so that you can have a relationship with me. I'm going to adopt you into my family. Is there any greater gift than that? Than the free gift of, of God through Jesus Christ? It's the ultimate expression, again, of grace. You've been hand-selected to receive God's grace into your life. And just to remind you, you are not an accident, but you were planned with a purpose. I worked with teenagers for many, 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 many years, and I have to remind them of this a lot. But it's not for teenagers, it's not just for teenagers, it's for everyone. But teens, listen up. Children, listen up. Everybody, listen up. Listen to what David writes. He says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knew you before you were born. You were knit together by God in your mother's womb. You are given the gift of grace. You are special. God loves you. In spite of all that you've done, in spite of all that I did, God loved me and gave me grace. God loves you and He chose you. Now some of you might ask, Scott, do you believe in predestination? Do you believe that God knows you and knows who's going to accept Christ and who's not going to accept Christ? And I say, I do. I do. God is sovereign, not God. But God knows everything. He knows who will accept Him. He knows who won't accept Him. You might be sitting there going, Scott, how do I know if I'm one of the ones who've been chosen? How do I know if I'm one of the ones who've been predestined? Well, here you go. You're sitting here this morning. You're here this morning. I believe that God ordained this moment today for you to hear how much He loves you and that He wants to have a relationship with you. You are here. And I don't know how it all works, but somehow His Holy Spirit gets inside of your life, gets inside of your heart and starts speaking to you and you start feeling this draw to Him. And again, I don't know how fully it works. I don't understand. It's a great mystery to me. Great mystery to me. But He gives you the ability to choose or to accept in that moment. What do you do? Are you going to receive this gift of grace, free gift of grace, or are you going to reject it or are you going to walk away? One thing I do know is this, is that the more often, the more times that you walk away, that you choose and say, I'll do it later, maybe next year, maybe next month, I, I want to kind of do my thing and then I'll do it, the easier it is to say no. You say no. God gives you a free gift of grace. You receive it today. He rose that you might have this gift of grace. Secondly, secondly, He has risen so that you can know privilege. Does anybody here feel privileged? Like you're a part of the 1%? Sometimes I don't. But if you've never felt like you're privileged, like you're honored, you are. You receive privilege because you have a relationship with God, through Jesus Christ. He rose so that you can experience that. Peter continues on, he says that you are a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Now, this is something that, that is misunderstood often and least practiced. See, because in our culture, in our society, in our, our world today, in the United States today, we don't really understand this concept of royalty, right? I mean, we have presidents. We don't have kings. We don't have queens. We don't have princes and princesses. We don't have that. So we don't understand that. So it, it may lose its effect on us. But you are of royalty. Get this. Whatever family you want to ascribe to, if you want to be a Gates or if you want to be a a Rockefeller, whatever that is, whatever world you think, you want to be a Kardashian, I, I, I would stay away from that. <laughs> but whatever you want to ascribe yourself to, it's greater than that. You are royalty. You have privilege. You, when you receive Jesus Christ in your life, you become a child of the king. You are a prince. You are a princess. You are joint heirs with Christ. You experience privilege. Privilege. And you have a job to do. 
See, in the Old Testament, the Levites, they were responsible to be priests, and they were responsible for the, the temple, for worship. But we lose that today. The entire nation of Israel was actually called to, to be a light into the nations. In Exodus 19, we read this. Now, if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This extends to us today. This is our calling today. This is not just my job to manage the church. It's not it. It's all of our job. We are all called to bear witness to the gospel. All of us are called to intercede on behalf of our, our family and our friends for all mankind to share the light of Christ with the world. As a matter of fact, one of the last things that Jesus told his followers before he ascended into heaven was this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness. You are a brother, a sister of Jesus, and you've been called to carry out his message, proclaim the gospel. You have purpose. He rose, first of all, so that you can know grace. Secondly, so that you can know privilege. Thirdly, so that you can know purpose. So that you can know purpose. He says that you are a holy nation. A holy nation. You, when you see Christ into your life, have been set apart. You're different. You're holy. You're a cut above. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Your life has been radically Changed. Peter says that you've been brought out of the darkness and into the light. See, darkness hides the truth. And the enemy wants to keep you there as long as possible. He does not want the world to know the grace, the mercy, the love of Jesus and for you to remember who it is that you belong to. Again, when, when you receive Christ, you understand that you are loved and you are adopted into God's family. Paul wrote this. It says, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. So that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, you are no longer a slave to sin. You are set free. You are a son. You are a daughter of the king. And because of that, you have a special relationship with God. You've heard this said probably before that when Paul uses this word, he says, Abba, Father, that's like daddy, daddy. That's a sign of intimacy. <laughs> When my kids were little, one of them, who renamed, who remained nameless, who's actually here this morning. <laughs> but she decided, when she was probably three or four years old, she was going to call me by my first name. Anybody else have that experience? Daddy. Daddy. Then it turned into Scott. Scott. And honestly, it irritated me. <laughs> it really did. For a while. And then I realized what she was doing. See, she recognized that to get my attention, people would call me by my first name. And so it was more of an indictment on me. Because what was I doing? I was ignoring my daughter. I was giving my attention to somebody else. I was exchanging my relationship with my daughter for my relationship with someone else. And I, I felt really bad. <laughs> so I had to sit all my kids down. And you've heard me tell this story before, and I said, look, there are only three people in the entire world that can call me dead. And it's you. You. And you can call me daddy forever. And I will always, always acknowledge you. Put a stop to that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the exact same thing with your Heavenly Father. When you receive him into your life, you have this deep relationship, this purpose with him. You are his child. You are his child. I told them on Friday that parenting is difficult. Can I get an amen? But that those three made it easier. Aww. And this is why I told you before, but I've gotten to have it. For about the past month of every day, writing them a little note, a little devotion. I read my, my Bible and I, I write something to them, a little bit of words of wisdom from Dad, that kind of thing. And so on Friday, this is what I read and I was reminded of, of that. 
In the book of Psalms, David writes, he says, For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. Now listen to this. Listen to this. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. You have a Heavenly Father. Now, I, I understand. Listen to me. I understand that some of you, when you hear the word Father, some of the best memories don't come to mind. And so when you hear Father, it could be difficult. But I want to tell you this morning, listen, that you have a perfect Father in Heaven who loves you with an everlasting love, who allowed His Son to come and to die so you can have a relationship with you. And I told my children, again, I'm not... None of us are perfect. We've all failed. And I've had to tell them I apologize and I'm sorry at times for things I've done and times I've neglected them or not been there for them. But you, my children, you, the church, you have a heavenly Father who is perfect and loves you with a perfect love. As a matter of fact, right here David says, He takes our sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west and He remembers it no more. It's gone. And so when he says fear here, I want you to understand this fear. It's not to be afraid, but it's an understanding of love that your Father has for you. Again, it's a perfect love. So when you receive Christ into your life, He rose so that you might be able to know grace, privilege, purpose, and fourthly, acceptance. Acceptance. Peter continues on and says that you are God's special possession. I hope you circle all these little phrases right here. You are God's special possession. Again, this is a simple message. Now I know this, that all of us at one point or another have felt left out. Haven't you? Have you ever felt left out? Like you were the last one picked in kickball? You were just a shrub? Maybe you were awkward and gawky a little bit. You felt like you were on the outside looking in. And no matter how hard you tried to fit in, you just couldn't. I mean, think of all the hairstyles. All the mullets out there. All the flat tops out there. All the perms. And I'm just talking about the guys. <laughs> Think of how high you wore your hair, ladies. Girls of the 80s, I know who you are. Hope had nothing on you with your hair. The clothes, the shoes, the parachute pants. All because you just wanted to be accepted. You wanted to be included. Here... Peter reminds us that we are a treasured possession. You are treasured by God. In Deuteronomy, Moses writes, says this, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And that extends to us today. You are special. You are a possession of God. You are a treasure. And it came at a very high price, and that was the death of Jesus on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sin. Of our sin. And the, that was the language that Peter would have used to remind them of who they were. You are a treasured possession. He came to pay that penalty for all of us so that we might be his treasured possession too. In Titus we read this, He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. You were a lost treasure. And he came searching for you. You were who he wanted. Not because you deserved it. Not because you earned it. But just out of the pure love that God has for you. I want to close with this story. Kind of cool things have been happening since I've opened this dialogue up with my kids. We text back and forth. And my daughter, Autumn, she said, Hey, Dad, I was reading my Bible this week and I read this devotion. And I read this. I thought it was really cool. Maybe you can share it. And I looked at it. I was like, Absolutely. It's awesome. I'm going to fit it in. We're going to make it work. And it works. It works. A few years ago, there was a movie release. It was based on a true story. During World War II, 
three out of four brothers were killed in action. And to save the family the agony of losing all of their children during the war, there was a mission to go out and to save that one. Private James Wright. Do you remember this? So after successfully rescuing Private Ryan, on their effort to get back, there was one final battle on a bridge. And right before the loss of their team leader, Captain John Miller, John Miller had one request for James Ryan. And I want you to see what that request was of James Ryan. great illustration. People willing to sacrifice and give up their lives so somebody else might be free and return home, but it doesn't go far enough. What was the one request that was made? What did he ask them to do? Earn this. Earn it. Now, if you know the movie the scene right after this, Private Ryan's wife comes up and he pleads with her. Tell me, I earned it. Tell me, I earned it. Tell me I was a good husband. Tell me I was a good father. Tell me I was a good person. See, here's where the illustration fails. There's nothing that you can do to earn God's love. He loves you unconditionally. He died for you out of pure love. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to make it up. It is a free gift to you. 
One day you can stand before God and He will say, Welcome into your eternal home, my good and faithful servant. Nothing good that you can do, only to receive the free gift that God has given. You were loved with an unconditional love. He died because of that unconditional love. You are accepted as a child of the King when you receive Jesus Christ into your life. And I just want to close with this, this thing. It's not the one that's saying, just for all one second. <laughs> this is just amazing to me. In the Old Testament, the word for to bless is barach. Barach. To bless. But the same word also means to kneel. So to bless is to kneel. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you with the gift of salvation. But in order for Him to bless you, God had to kneel in humility. God meant for you so that you might be blessed. In the book of Philippians, Paul says this, Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for His own advantage. Rather, He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God knelt. He humbled himself. He left heaven. He dwelt among us. He took on human form and he died a real death. But, but, he rose. He proclaimed victory over death. Do you know that this morning? Have you received that into your life? Was that revealed to you this morning? Maybe for the first time, did you hear this morning, Jesus came and he died on the cross for my sins so that I might be free, so that I might be a child of his, so that I might be accepted of his, so I might know purpose, but I'm a treasure. Did you need to be reminded of that this morning? Have you forgotten that? Have you allowed your eyes to be blinded to that truth? So if you know that, if you realize that, then I want you to ask yourself this question. He is risen so that I can be what? You're going to have to fill that in. He is risen so that I can be what? Free, forgiven, found, What? How are you living the freedom, the forgiveness that you found in relationship with Jesus? So again, this is kind of awkward for me. It's just, just how it is. I'm not used to this kind of thing. So I'm going to pray. And when I'm going to finish praying. Darius going to come and Brian's going to come and they're going to lead us in a song. And I'm going to ask you to stand at that time. And during that time, if you feel like God is just been speaking to you and you, whatever it is that you want to do. You want to come pray, you want to give your life to Christ, whatever it is, I would invite you to come to the sides. I'll be down here again in the front. It's not gonna, we're not going to stare at you or make it uncomfortable for you. Just come down and pray. You can go to the back and some of our deacons back there. You can pray with them, whatever, whatever you want to do this morning. So, we pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you that we can come again and worship together in freedom. God, we already know this morning that there were Christians targeted around the world. There are Christians who lost their lives today around the world just for simply proclaiming your name, Jesus. God, we pray that you would be with our brothers and sisters, God, who are experiencing martyrdom today, persecution today, in ways that we don't understand and comprehend. And God, we just want to say thank you that we live in a free country where we can worship you without you. But even greater than that, God, God, I pray that, that if there's somebody here this morning that needs to give their life to you, that they might be that day of victory, of salvation, that they would realize that there's nothing they can do to earn your love. It is a free gift that you give to each and every one of us. We simply must choose to receive it. God, I pray that you would be with us now, God, again, we thank you for today. And this is your son's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Blaine family, your child upstairs is sick. Can you come upstairs, please? Blaine family.
Somebody wasn't distracted during the service because they left their phone in the fire lock. So <laughs> thank you for the great illustration. I appreciate that so much. Um, we have lots of things happening here at the church. You can find those in your bulletin. You can go online to our website. You can look on Facebook. Um, lots of ways for you to know what's going on. We send out a, a weekly newsletter, a monthly newsletter. And just uh, so you can subscribe and we'll get information to you. Um, if you're one of our guests, I'd love to meet you. I'll be over in our Connect corner over here. I'll shake your hand and have a gift for you. Um, I'd just love to introduce myself again to you. And then um, John and Judy, this is their last Sunday officially with us. Um, they sold their house down in Flowers and they're going to be moving to Fayetteville. So last official Sunday, just when we were going to start a tongue choir. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so thank you all for this, what you've done here in the church, how you serve us, we really appreciate it, we miss you guys. Alright, so this time would you stand up, I'm going to pray, and then we have one final and closing song, and you guys have a great, great day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to come and gather together in your house, God, we thank you that uh, we can know you and have a personal relationship with you. God, I pray that we would do what we can to continue to carry your light into the places where we go. God, I pray that you just bless the families that are represented here this morning, God, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.